What I want to talk to you today is the genesis of an idea that the town had is to do something with a very large source of stormwater that was going past our town boundary out to the ocean. And so what do I want to touch upon today is, well, why did we look at this project? What was the project itself? What did we learn? And some conclusions we could draw. So why did we do this? What I can show you here is Herds, whoops. Herdsman Lake is just outside the town's boundary. It's a very large lake that has stormwater inflows from surrounding areas, as well as groundwater sources. The Water Corporation maintain an open drain that goes into a tunnel out to ocean outfall. And it runs very close to our town boundary. That's the boundary of the town of Cambridge and the city of Stirling uh, to our north. So we saw that there was a big, large source of water very close nearby. Our councillors challenged the administration. They saw this water going to ocean as an apparent waste of water that's only been used once, was the terms they were talking through. They challenged us in terms of, is it good for the environment we start looking at reusing this water, wholly or partially? And secondly, in a drying climate, where the town itself abstracts water from the superficial aquifer for its parks and gardens, are we looking at a potential risk mitigation tool? So they were the two main challenges that were put to us. So we undertook a project to investigate what's the feasibility of looking at this stormwater reuse. And we engaged a consulting team which, with GHD with uh, Nick Deeks's help. The general idea was that at Wembley Golf Course, which is operated by the town, we could create potentially a basin here and capture some or all of the stormwater as it goes past us. Secondly, we have a dam at the top end of the course that we pump into from our various balls on the golf course, which we use for our course irrigation. So there's two issues in water going through there that we had to consider. What we needed to find out, how much water is actually going out to the ocean to see if it's viable. What are the options that were presented and the benefits of harvesting some or all of this water? What are the likely operating and capital costs because the town is effectively spending ratepayers' money on this? And then, more importantly, doing a high-order risk assessment because these things are not simple nor easy. We had a previous experience on, a, on another uh, water project, a stormwater harvesting project, that showed us that the various regulatory approvals themselves are quite difficult to, to work your way through. What did we learn? What we learned is that Water Corporation between 1993 and 1999 had flow metering on this drain, and then stopped recording. So the last data we had was 12 years old at least. It showed approximately nine gigalitres a year of water flows to the ocean, so it's not a small amount of water. There was random sampling of water quality. I use the initials HMD to refer to Herdsman Main Drain because it's simpler. The time, the frequency, and the quality of that water sampling was haphazard. Similarly, the time, frequency, and quality of the water sampling of the groundwater or the superficial aquifer inside the golf course was also random, and they didn't align, which presented us and our consultants with the challenge of making legible and understandable analysis of the impacts of putting the water 
back into the ground locally. We determined we could infiltrate or capture the groundwater, or sorry, the stormwater, we could infiltrate it by gravity or pump. In other words, the drain that went past the town was sufficiently higher than our proposed retention basin and infiltration basin that we could just connect it by a pipe and let, let gravity do its job and or not pump it. That led us down to a very quick school of thought that the obvious energy savings that was worthy of further consideration and became the focus of our discussions. We did look at saying as the tunnel for the drain, the main drain, flowed underneath our golf course dam, we could actually capture it there as well, or as well, pump it up into the dam to use for the town, for the golf course's irrigation purposes, thus turning off our bores. We could create a feature wetlands in the basin in the golf course because it's a piece of bushland which had some environmental benefits and a community amenity. We could create some feature lakes or water hazards or shit, there goes my golf ball for our golf course. And finally, there was a fourth project we thought about was that it runs, the town also runs Perry Lakes Reserve, which is a, a lake system that is drying quite substantially in this climate. Could we potentially capture the stormwater and pipe it or pump it down to Perry Lakes and give, give the lake back its life. So that's what the consulting team basically had a look at for us. And I'll just put those in context for you. The tunnel structure starts here, so it would be just a pipe work to the infiltration basin, all the wetlands, all the feature lakes that will be built there. Our golf course dam for irrigation is right above the tunnel, so we could punch down and grab the water. Or well, finally, Perry Lakes, which is about two pipe kilometres away, we'd have to go through the street reserves to get down to Perry Lakes. That, that option was obviously looking the, the worst for wear in terms of cost. What we determined... The, the gravity feed system was obviously the most feasible thing we could investigate. There was enough head pressure to get the drain to feed into the basin, to have the basin to operate at a, at a size that it could infiltrate and not to back up the water corporation's drain so it started to um, flow into people's houses, which was a bit of a concern that Water Corp had. One of the issues, and um, you, know, you spoke of it before, the superficial aquifer is very close to the ground here. We've probably got a metre and a half space between the bottom of our basin and the nominal top of the, the aquifer. So we saw that if we started to infiltrate at substantial rates, we were going to surface express all over the golf course water and that wasn't going to be a good look. So the analysis by GHD showed that realistically about only 20% of the 9 gigalitres could be harvested before it became problematic. Fortunately, that 20% was, was well in excess of what the town currently abstracts from all the bores for all the parks and all the reserves in the town. So it was, in fact, if we could put 20% back in, it would be much less, it would be more than what we're taking out. So there was a, a good sort of analogy lining up there. The entry level risk assessment. It was quite clear there were too many unknowns that needed further analysis. Water quality, what's in the water, how well does the match does the stormwater match the groundwater? Were key concerns that the regulatory agencies wanted to get their heads around. 
One of the discussion points raised was, well, yes, if we create an infiltration basin of about a hectare to a hectare and a half, we're going to lose that amount of bush. Are we trading off one environmental benefit for another environmental benefit in terms of taking out vegetation that's been standing there for a while? So that was something we had to ponder. And finally, the analysis was showing us that the two key business drivers were starting to become more apparent. Firstly, we could use the water as a risk, risk measure if our bore licences were under threat. So it was a business protection piece of work. And secondly, the gravity feed system had to be the one we focused on because of the costs of pumping over the next 20 to 50 years, we're just going to get out of all reach. That quickly knocked out the use for Perry Lakes. It also knocked out the fact that we could use it to create water hazards or feature lakes for golfers because it wouldn't have generated probably one extra golfer over the life of the, of the whole project. So in essence, what our design was showing us is this is the cross-section of the drain and our infiltration basin with just the pipe connection that would go under Empire Avenue. It shows that by a weir structure that could be installed, we'd back up a bit of the flow coming from Herdsman Lake and the pipe would then feed it into the basin. So it was a very simple, technically very simple system to do. The basin, as I said, we modelled between half a hectare to two hectare sizes and the sweet spot seemed to be about a hectare, a hectare and a half surface area. Then it got into the meat and potatoes of cost. Nearly a million dollars worth of capital was required to infiltrate this much water. And the analysis showed that we'd have to reserve about $125,000 a year for the full life of the project to allow for, as sediments settle in these basins, we'd have to dredge them to make the, the basins continue infiltration. So there was quite a, quite a large cost involved in capturing or offsetting our to uh, 1.6 gigalitres we abstract at the moment from the superficial aquifer. We looked at the Perry Lakes issue because that had a lot of community interest and the, the capital cost was $4.5 million, which the town certainly couldn't, couldn't face. These costs also assumed, rightly or wrongly, that we didn't need to treat the source water to get it to match the aquifer water and to also deal with any environmental or health risks that existed. It was a large assumption to be made, but again, we didn't have the data to support anything else. It led the local governments, obviously, to a, a very quick conclusion that um, these are very large costs to impose solely on ratepayers. And if there are benefits for these projects in reducing abstraction from the aquifer, maybe support from the states or feds in terms of grant funding could be appropriate in these schemes. Um, the timing of the project was horrible um, and I'd recognise Bill's effort here. Bill Till was assisting the local governments in a grant scheme the Commonwealth was running for stormwater harvesting we unfortunately were not in a position to have this knowledge about this project to support, to go forward with an application. However, again, as I say, Bill was instrumental in trying to pull together local government schemes for, for Commonwealth funding. And I think these are the avenues that should be pursued. So what we did find is that it was an absolute paucity of relevant data. So if we were going to go forward, we need to know more. We didn't know enough. What we did learn 
from the department is that they were turning their heads towards a, co a conceptual view of backwater banking if a local government authority was thinking of recharging the superficial aquifer as an offset for what it abstracts from the superficial aquifer. They were looking at policy issues in that regard because it was something that they hadn't turned their heads towards as opposed to the same issues with the, uh, the deep aquifer. We had then, of course, the environmental issue. What's, be what's better? Taking out a tree to save some water or leaving a tree to let some water go to the ocean? And I don't have an answer for that. I'm sorry, I, we, we didn't get a view around the table. And finally, the, the entry-level risk analysis and the discussions with the regulatory agencies, water, DC, EPA, etc., showed that we needed to know more information, which meant more consulting time and more consulting cost, before we could go forward with a decision as to what this project was going to cost in real terms. So we reached some conclusions. The, this was presented to our council. They appreciated the impacts, the broad order benefits and the broad order costs. It allowed them to, to deal with this matter as a consideration for future funding. They did say, however, that the impost of funding nearly a million dollars of capital and $125,000 a year by itself was too much on our ratepayers. We have less than 20,000 ratepayers in the town, so you could see that it was going to be a, a real number every year on your rates. That was material. They felt that it was appropriate that given the broader benefits to water in this state, that co-funding arrangements should be pursued before the town would proceed with the project. So, in conclusion, we determined this project was technically feasible. It looked simple. It wasn't hard. It wasn't groundbreaking. A gravity-fed pipe into a basin, it isn't rocket science. So that was good. So there was very little technical risk to the project. It did have substantial investment, and we can't overemphasise what that means to small local governments in doing these sorts of projects. It did validate and provide the town with a backup plan. Plan B, if in a drying climate the state needs to seriously think about people's uses of bores, especially large areas or local government authorities for, con for continuing to water our parks and gardens for community amenity. Now that's not to say the town is actually well down the track of a water-wise uh, native replanting program, but they still have large reserves and sporting ovals that need water. So we can see the day coming forward where the state is going to have to seriously look at how bore uses are going forward and this potential scheme gives us our breathing space, as it were. But more importantly, it's clear it, this is a joint venture. It needs support from the state, and I think I'm advocating here that the state governments sometimes, in some agencies, have a view that disposing of the water in the most cost-efficient manner is, is their gig, and that's the way they've got to do it. And letting it run down a pipe out to the ocean is cost effective. There's no question about it. Is it the most sensible use of what water that's been used once? And I put that out as a bit of a thought provoker to people. That's me done. Thank you very much.